Also by uh, Larry DeMarco and company at uh, Modern Century 21 Modern Realty Results. I like this uh, uh, sponsorship break because it's my all-Italian sponsorship break here. I, I got uh, DeMarco at an Orsini uh, bringing in um, Rob Mario and uh, Matt Harvey and John Gilstrap. It's all good. Gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I appreciate your discipline in not attacking the muffins during the commercial break, thereby creating a sticky mess all around your area. Your discipline is noted. We were wrestling with the chairs. We forgot about them. <laughs> and hydrogen water. Uh, also, we are sponsored by Parsons Ford of Martinsburg. We became number one by making you number one first. And by WVU Medicine, Berkeley Medical Center, Jefferson Medical Center, leading healthcare here and everywhere. And speaking of Jefferson, yes. I just wanted to, how remarkable the poise of Amelia Dugan on, Absolutely. on the radio. And for I don't know how old she is, 18, I guess, maybe 17, be a 18. Senior in high school, yeah. um, I didn't have that level of poise at that age at all. Or last week. And or last week, <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and I mean I think there's a lot of pressure being on on the race. She wasn't nervous or anything. And I thought it was she just did a, very a well. marvelous. The people job. that do these pageants have to commit to, you know, overcoming those obstacles and it, it clearly serves them well. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. That's a life skill. Absolutely. That's why she won the pageant. That's why she said her interview skills were through the roof. Mm -hmm. That voice belonging to Wayne Clark, as in Delegate Wayne Clark. Wayne, good morning to you, sir. Thanks for coming in. Morning. Glad to be here. Back from the Southern Legislative Conference that was held in uh, Greenbrier. Think, yes, right? yes. My third uh, Southern Legislative Conference that I've attended. Uh, Oklahoma City, Charleston, uh, South Carolina, and now, of course, West Virginia. Uh, three years in a row. Um, i got to say, mad props to chelsea ruby and everything she did and she went through um unlike us who are fighting a, a, a terrible drought uh it rained nearly every day down at the greenbrier and just making adjustments uh moving from outside to tents to back inside the building and just the overall process of slc um, if you've never if you're a legislator if you've never been to an slc it's something you really want to go to um just sitting down and being able to to you know um, talk to other legislators from other states that are fighting the same issues that you're fighting just maybe in a different way um, i had a great opportunity to present um, the you know where the state is uh during the economic development and transportation um uh, peace breakfast and set in on historic tax credit uh, seminar and set in on a uh, child care seminar <clears throat> So those were kind of three of my major highlights of the uh, of the event. And economic development in the state is your concentration as a legislator, Wayne. And on that note, in your backyard is the Hilltop House yes. in uh, Harper's Ferry. We've done several interviews on this with uh, the people who are behind uh, bringing that back and have been trying to for almost two decades now. What is the status in terms of the development of this uh, project and... Uh, I th if I understand it, I know that the legislature is still involved in this because there's another, one more step that you folks have to address to make this happen. Yeah, so um, I know that they're, they're applying for a uh, stiff uh, state tax deferred um, to help with the cost of, of the construction. Um, obviously, the Schaufelds uh, are are in it for the long run. They're still sticking around here, uh, trying to get everything done uh, to make this process happen. It's the, the construction cost is, is uh, climbing obviously with inflation and everything else that we have uh, in the economy. But uh, I still uh, strongly feel that uh, once they get started, we'll, we'll have um, opening doors within two years of, of initial construction. How, how does the TIF work? So uh, for this one specifically, um, what they're looking to do is they're, they're having the um, sales tax portion um, expanded over a 30-year process. Uh, and what that does is it gives them the opportunity to use more of their money now uh, for the construction. I, I remember um, back in 23, I toured, toured their warehouse uh, down in Northern Virginia and uh, they're looking at a cost of around sixty thousand dollars per room to to reconstruct. 
they're or they're having the beds made specifically to look like they were from the 1920s the sconces all the little details um, the curio cabinets that are in uh, the bathrooms are all uh, um, uh, subway tile uh, it is just absolutely amazing what they what they have plans for so so any kind of assistance that we can give them um, to, to enhance that and when you look at what that's going to do for the hotel motel tax uh, within Jefferson County uh, the sales tax um, in regards to the uh, 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 purchases of the food and beverage and just overall economic uh, growth people doing tours people doing uh, obviously, people coming in to the golf course, people, you know, going to River Riders, people, uh, you know, doing tours downtown Charlestown and Harper's Ferry. Um, the Hilltop House is a is going to be a staple for um, Jefferson County. It's going to match what the racetrack has done for us. Matt Harvey, I'm going to go to you first so that people don't use up all your good questions first. Uh, you talked about ch- you, you attended a, uh, a session on child care. Yes, sir. And... I think it's pretty clear that that's we're in dire needs of more child care in West Virginia. It, are other states having that same issue? And if so, how are they dealing with it? And this was at the Stubblefield Institute last night, correct? Correct. Wayne? Correct. Yes. Last night we uh, a great panel uh, discussing the issues that we have in uh, in West Virginia. So we are we are a child care desert, um, without a doubt. And um, you know, other states, Virginia, Kentucky have done massive things to enhance one of the most important things they've done and um, I'm going to be looking at uh, working on that is they move child care from we have it now under Department of Health Services DHS and they moved it over to education and they treat it as early childhood education and by moving it over the education it was a little bit easier to get the funding for it um kentucky just give you a makeup of of kentucky they're super majority republicans um with a democrat mayor uh Dem- democrat governor uh, virginia opposite way uh they're super they're a majority democrat with a republican governor um but they both recognized that they need to do something um i got some statistics here which are shocking um Here's, here's one flyer here so everybody can see. It costs more to put your child through early childhood uh, care than it does to send your child to any four-year institution in West Virginia or Virginia. And think about everything that people are saying, you know, well, college is too expensive. Now look at how, what child care is. So we have so many issues in regards to, to child care that if we don't address it, this is a major economic development um, driver uh, currently right now we have 54 percent workforce participation why because they can't get child care or they can't afford child care uh, the state has to work on something um, I would like to see a, a triple play process and what that triple play process is is that um, three people are involved the state the parent and the business uh, are all involved in giving uh, paying the child care maybe a third a third a third uh, obviously, the business gets a opportunity to take a uh, tax deduction on their payroll tax or or sales tax or state tax, something that is offsetting that. Um, obviously, the state has got to get involved with it. Um, you know, Kentucky funded 60 million, uh, Virginia funded 90 million. Uh, we tried an amendment in May to get 23 million. We got close, but but we failed. But uh, there's got to be something that has to be done. Uh, I hear everybody say, oh, well, you know, the state shouldn't be involved in child care or daycare. Okay, we're not involved in child care or daycare. We need to be involved in early child education. And um, that is something that is that has been proven that when kids go to an early child education facility, they excel better in schools. New businesses coming in. What do they want to know? What's our workforce? How is it educated? You know, uh, what is the participation? The more people we get going to child care, more people getting into the workforce, the better the state is in the long run. You know, four years ago, I lived in Fairfax County, where the the franchise fi- child care facilities like Kinder Care and those things grow like Dollar Trees. They're everywhere. 
while we're talking about doing tax breaks for businesses, have we considered doing tax breaks for some of these child care places? So we, uh, we passed a bill in 22, and what that did is allowed businesses that if they built a child care facility on site, um, they, got, uh, they were able to defer uh, the cost of that against their sales tax over a 10 year period. Um, and then they were able to defer some of the uh, expenses on their sales tax. The unfortunate part is, especially in Jefferson County, we don't have businesses that are big enough where, where that is needed. So we would like to see something um, in regards to where um, we're giving tax credits for the businesses you know, that are off site. Now, more specifically on, on these franchise uh, processes, um, Mountain State, which is the organization that pays uh, the DHS kids, okay? Uh, our business model for that in our state is flawed. So where, um, you know, Matt, you have a youngster and you go to child care, you pay for that whole week. And if your child shows up once, you still pay for that whole week. Well, Mountain State only, show, only pays when the child attends. Not only that, it only at pays when the child attends by hours. So if the child only goes for two hours, they only pay one third of that day. Two to four hours, they pay half. Anything over four, they pay a full. And then the payment is upwards of 45 days late. So now you have a child care facility that has, let's say they have 12 kids that are in, um, that are Mountain State kids. Well, now they need two providers. Now all 12 of them don't show up. But they're still paying their providers. Now the provider's only making $10 an hour, $12 an hour. The state median is $12 an hour. Yet they have to do the same thing that every single one of our teachers has to do. And our teachers are starting at, you know, 40, what is, where are we at, 43, 44? You know, you can go to Chick-fil-A. Everybody knows, you know, the kids behind Chick-fil-A, they're making $15 an hour to say, you know, uh, my pleasure. Well, we've got people that are teaching our kids that are making 10 to $12 an hour. We have a majorly flawed system. How do you fix it? That's a great question. Yeah. We, got, we take some of the uh, uh, legislation that Kentucky has passed. We take some of the legislation that Mississippi has passed and some of the uh, legislation that Virginia has passed, and we put it together. I know there is a team down in Charleston that has been working. Uh, Max, uh, our attorney for economic development, is one that sits on that, on that committee. Um, it, um, you know, work group, I'll say, uh, not committee, work group that, that has been um, trying to figure out exactly what the state needs to do. Does the state have to be involved with some type of subsidy to ultimately balance this out, Wayne? Or is that too much? I know you addressed it earlier. Is that too much state taxpayer involvement? So I, I, I will go with both arguments. I will go with the far right Republican argument is, you know, the state should not be involved with this at all. Okay, don't I don't want to send my taxpayer money. I understand that. Um, and then we can go with the far left, you know, the far left saying, oh, we should fund every single dime of it. It should all be state run, just like public schools. You know, so somehow and you all know, I'm, I'm a guy who wants to see things get done. You're a pragmatist, you know. All right, how do we take both of these scenarios and put them together into one? And the state needs to be involved at some sort, you know, and that's where I think this triple play process is probably the best, where each person, each per party involved, the business that um, has the employer, the parent, and the state are all being involved in this process to get this thing done. When we had De uh, Delegate Elias Coop Gonzalez on the program, he mentioned he was opposed to the state's involvement in daycare uh, subsidies because he felt it might encourage women who would otherwise choose to stay home with their children. It would encourage them to go to work and put their kids in daycare if the state was paying for part of it. Well, I can understand that, that comment, um, and it's I'll look at this. Uh, Elias Coop Gonzalez says daycare. I say early childhood education. Two different factors. Um, the other part is um, we have 54% workforce participation. That, that number might have changed. You know, somebody can, you know, fact check me on mm -hmm. that, but it's pretty close. Um, and the other thing is, look at what happens when, let's say, let's say, let's say the mother decides to stay home in a scenario, or the father decides to stay at home. You know, either one doesn't matter. And they have two kids, and the kids are 18 months apart. 
you're talking about someone being out of the workforce for five to six years. What's the first question when they're going for an interview? What you been doing for five years? The economy, the, the tech has all bypassed you. All the training that you have is all dinosaur. You know, I don't want to have to pay, send you to back to school so you can learn to be back, you know, to be up to speed with everybody else. I don't want I don't want to have this learning curve. So that person gets passed over for the job. They want to work. That's why they're in an interview. But they can't get the job because they've been out of the workforce for too long. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I like I said, there's both arguments for both sides. How do we fix it? That's that's going to be a long, long, long debate on how to get that fixed. Well, there, this was a priority of the speaker last year, Correct. addressing child care, and it did, and no legislation, nothing meaningful was passed regarding it. Why? So, um, I had a few bills that were introduced, and um, shortly after introduction, um, they they announced that they created a. Um, Child, child Care Task Force, a um, little subcommittee. Kathy Hess Krause was uh, overseeing that, and they were hoping that something came out of um, that committee. And um, then we get into the, the budget issue that we had at the end of the session about this 400 and some odd million dollar clawback that we might have had from COVID money from, from the Department of Ed. And, and it just all snowballed and it all just kind of fizzled off. Um, so I don't know, maybe in August, there's something, uh, that gets introduced that, uh, in our special session that addresses this, but, uh, you know, we have to fix something. We have to change something. We it, ha- have to get better. Is delegate Gonzalez's view, the predominant view is, is, it, is or is there, I don't think so for it to because, pass? um, when we tried Kayla Young introduced, I, I believe it was Kayla Young's amendment. Um, to fund child care, $23 million. And that was just a backfill. It was a one-time uh, appropriation. It was just a backfill um, what DHS was behind on paying to the child care facilities. Uh, we got close. We got 46, 48 votes on that amendment. So we, we, were, we were close. So I can't say, you know, that it's predominant. You know, it did fail. Um, but I think a lot of people are educated on – on how this is a major economic development impact uh, for the state. So so that amendment was just to pay what West Virginia owed these providers? In a way. So it it was to make some of these providers whole, you know, and going back and paying them for the slot, not for the attendance. Okay. 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 So there was a little. Correct. You know, so it it wasn't a line item ad you know, that we were going to fund this $23 million every single year. It was a one-time appropriation just to kind of get that back. So in during the COVID years, um, part of the COVID money is all the child care facilities got paid by the slot, not by attendance, period. Now, I'm not going to say that, you know, you know, that was people did the right thing with that money, but, you know, it, it did make the child care facilities whole. You know, if you look at the business model of a of a uh, early early child education facility, um, it's a failed business model because of the expenses that are built in, with making sure the curriculum, make sure that you know they have to provide food meals. You know, ima- imagine imagine you know having a day camp, and you have a hundred kids signed up, and you got to provide breakfast and lunch, and you had five kids show. What do you do with all that food? Well, did were you given any cost average cost of daycare in West Virginia between the summit at the Greenbrier or, or yesterday? So we're we're roughly give or take uh, just short of seven hundred dollars a month is is roughly the expense per child. At a daycare facility statewide. Statewide, because it's statewide. clearly higher here. Oh, absolutely. In the Eastern here. Panhandle. It's close to $1,300 a month. I mean, you know, uh, the new apartments that are across from my neighborhood in Huntfield, the single family, the single, be- the one bedrooms are renting at 1800 a month. So, I mean, you're talking about a mortgage payment for some people in some parts of the state, just in Jefferson County. You know, obviously we know you can't get a mortgage for 1300 in Jefferson County, but... Uh, yeah. Now, in, in Fairfax County, there was the SAC program, school-aged child care, 
which was essentially the, every school, elementary school, would stay open after hours, essentially as continuing education, daycare, or whatever, for which the parents would pay. And I, it's been a long time, so I forget what we would pay. It was not a usurious amount. It was a lot cheaper than going to one of the franchises, but it was enough. I, I, I don't know the inner workings of how that worked. Is something like that done locally or something like that possible? And it'll be done beforehand, too. Right. So some of our schools do, some of our elementary schools do have that extended care process. Um, I know uh, the Eastern Panhandle Preparatory Academy, as an example, had, uh, it was $10 whether you came in the morning or $10 at n- in the afternoon, but they pretty much covered the kids from 7 to 5, um, which gave, you know, school ended out at 3.30, 3.20, so gave that a little additional um time for the parents to get off of work and do all that stuff so um and and i know and i can't remember the name of it um there is a program in jefferson county that that does that same thing um and they actually some of the schools they'll actually bus the kids from one school to the other where the facility is it's not at every school Uh, i believe if i'm thinking correctly in our area page jackson um the school right next to huntfield is the one and the kids from right denny get bussed over to page jackson for that additional time so but i like i said i can't remember the name of it wayne 30 seconds left final word is yours well thank you guys for having me on i i appreciate it i haven't been on for for quite some time it's been that long it, it has that's my that's my fault man that's okay that's okay you know um i don't i don't know if people notice but um I, i've changed my health and done a pretty good job and i've you lost good man 22 pounds um if you want to know my trick um i stopped drinking raw milk and went to pasteurized milk <laughs> <laughs> that's gonna upset hornby <laughs> hey we've got a final minute coming up with delegate wayne clark next don't go away